well. Let me introduce our first presentation tonight from Dr. Marcus Borg. He holds a PhD from Oxford University, and he is a distinguished professor of religion and culture at Oregon State University. Matter of fact, I had just read the other day that he is the first person in the College of Liberal Arts to be dis distinguished in that way. And also, he has been named outstanding teacher at that university and received almost all of OSU's major teaching awards. He is the author of such books as Jesus, A New Vision, and Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time. He's lectured widely in this country as well as overseas in England and Austria, Germany, Belgium, Hungary, Israel, and South Africa. And his books have been translated into German, Dutch, Korean, and French. And I mentioned that Peter Jennings special. Perhaps some of you actually see, saw him on that television program. Won't you please welcome Dr. Marcus Borg. Well, I want to begin tonight by saying that it's nice for me to be here. This is the first time I've been in Denton. I've been in Texas a number of times, but not here before. And that's, of course, also the first time I've been on your campus. And because our time limits are uh, tightly controlled tonight, I'm not going to say anything more to sort of charm you or endear myself to you, but get right down to the point. <clears throat> As I see tonight's debate, I trust that it's not really about winning or losing, though it's possible that some of you are hoping for a food fight. Rather, I see it as about deepening our understanding of where we agree and where we disagree, what's at stake in these disagreements, and most importantly, about deepening our understanding of Easter. And there will be three main parts to my opening statement. Part one will be a prologue in which I speak briefly about the nature of the Bible and the Gospels. Part two, the historical ground of Easter, what do I think happened? And part three, the central truth claims of Easter. So I turn to part one, a crucial prologue, a foundational issue for our subject tonight namely the question of how we see the Bible and the Gospels. Are we to see the Bible and the Gospels as a divine product or as a human product? Now, if you see the Bible as a divine product, having some kind of divine guarantee to be factually true, or if you see it as inerrant or infallible, as inspired by the Holy Spirit in such a way so that, it is, so that the Bible is historically accurate in what it reports, then in an important sense the debate is over. Or more precisely, the debate needs to be about the nature of the Bible. Now a very important qualifying remark. I am not attributing this view to Bill Craig. From his published statements, I gather that he does not think of the Bible this way. Though if he wants to correct me on that, he's most welcome to, of course. So this remark is really addressed to you as an audience and not to Bill in particular. And because of the importance of this question, the rest of my prologue concerns how I see the Gospels very compactly in two statements. The first statement, they are a developing tradition. And I mean two things by that. On the one hand, I mean that all four of the Gospels of the New Testament are written in the last third of the first century. Mark, the earliest Gospel around the year 70, Matthew and Luke probably in the 80s, John probably in the 90s. And thus, Mark tells us how the story of Easter was being told around the year 70. Matthew and Luke tell us how the stories of Easter were being told in the 80s. John tells us how the stories of Easter were being told in the 90s. The second thing I mean when I say they are a developing tradition is that the traditions about Jesus grow and develop from the time of his death around the year 30 until the Gospels are written. They are added to, uh, they're added to in part because of the early Christian community's ongoing experience of the risen living Christ and added to as well as the early Christian movement 
uh, moves beyond the Jewish homeland and into the broader Mediterranean world. That means that the Gospels have both earlier layers of tradition and later layers of tradition. Or to change the metaphor slightly, that means that the Gospels contain minimally two voices. The voice of Jesus on the one hand and the voice of the early Christian communities um, interpreting the significance of Jesus, offering their testimony and witness to Jesus and so forth. Second statement about the nature of the Gospels. And by the way, what I'm saying here is broadly shared by mainline scholars. These views are not idiosyncratic to me, okay? And so I'm reporting out how this is seen within what we might call moderate to liberal biblical scholarship. Second statement. The Gospels combine memory and metaphor or they combine history and metaphor, or the same thought expressed with two more phrases. The Gospels are a combination of history remembered on the one hand and history metaphorized on the other hand. And yet one more statement, the Gospels are a combination of historical memory and metaphorical narrative. Now what do I mean by that language? What I mean by history remembered is, I trust, transparently clear. Some of the things reported in the Gospels really happened. Uh, some of the things that are said about Jesus having said them were really said and so forth. And the community preserved the memory of those things having happened or having been said. What I mean by history metaphorized needs a bit more explanation. I divide history metaphorized into two subcategories. The first subcategory, kind of an ugly word coming at you here, <clears throat> the metaphorization of something that happened. Quick example, Jesus really did make a final journey to Jerusalem. That's the history part of it. But the way Mark, followed by Matthew and Luke, the way Mark tells the story of that, Jesus, of, of that final journey to Jerusalem gives it a metaphorical meaning as well. As Mark tells the story, <clears throat> it becomes a story about discipleship and of what it means to follow Jesus and so forth. That's history metaphorized. The other subcategory of history metaphorized is what I call purely metaphorical narratives. Here there is not a particular historical incident behind the story, but the whole story works metaphorically or symbolically. So to put this together, stories in the Gospels, including the Easter stories, can be of three kinds. History remembered, history metaphorized, or purely metaphorical narratives. Now very importantly, Metaphorical language can be true, and I need to emphasize that because many people in our culture devalue metaphor. Many of my undergraduates, for example, will oftentimes say, you mean it's only a metaphor or it's only a symbol, as if symbols and metaphors are somehow less than facts. And so I want to emphasize that metaphor and symbol can be true. Two further comments about metaphor. Metaphor is the more than literal meaning of language. It is not less than factual, but more than literal. And the second comment <clears throat> consists of a Swedish proverb that I ran into about a year ago that I've become very fond of. I'm going to modify it slightly, but first I will quote it directly. In its original form, it goes like this, quote, Theology is poetry plus, not science minus, end of quote. Theology is poetry plus, not science minus. What I understand that to mean is that theology is more than poetry in that it makes a truth claim, but it is not a language that is somehow inferior to science or the language of factuality. 
to apply that to tonight, biblical metaphor is poetry plus, not somehow inferior to historical reporting. And the reason this matters, of course, is that I see some of the Easter stories as metaphorical narratives and not as straightforward historical reports. But for me, that in no way lessens their meaning. I move to part two. The historical ground of Easter. What do I see as the central historical claim of Easter? Put very simply, directly, and compactly, the followers of Jesus continued to experience him as a living reality after his death. I take the New Testament reports of some